Well, greetings, everyone, and welcome to the EKG case for the week of March 12th, 2013. This week's case was sent to us by Dr. Monica Lusiak. Monica is a second year emergency medicine resident at the Parkland program. That's University of Texas Southwestern. It's a great program. And the residents at that program have sent me more excellent EKGs than just about any other program I can possibly imagine, except perhaps our own residents. Although I have to bribe our own residents by giving them big giant chocolate chip cookies for every good EKG they give me. And the folks at Parkland have never asked me for any cookies before. So uh, I thank you all. And thanks to Monica for sending this uh, EKG. But if I run into you guys at ASEP, uh, I will get you cookies, all right? So keep them coming. Anyway, Monica had a case of a 40-year-old woman who presented to the emergency department with some shortness of breath and some orthopnea. And uh, on brief history, they uh, discovered that she had a history of metastatic cancer. Now, cancer plus shortness of breath, the first, second, third thing that you're probably going to be thinking of is pulmonary embolism. And we've talked some about pulmonary embolism EKG findings before. We can talk about it again. But there's one other really, really, really important thing that you've got to think about, especially in this day and age. You've always got to think about the possibility of one other thing. And we'll talk about in just a second. When you've got patients that have a history of cancer and uh, they present with shortness of breath. Well, this was the 12 lead EKG that Monica and her colleagues got on this particular patient. And there's probably an abnormality or actually a triad that's jumping out at you already. And uh, unfortunately, it's not always this obvious. But anyway, what you're looking at here, this is a sinus tachycardia for one thing. So the patient's tachycardic. Well, that doesn't narrow it down. This is a sick patient. So tachycardia is very present uh, in many, many sick patients. There's also uh, really small QRS complexes. There's low voltage in the limb leads. There's low voltage in the precordial leads also. And we'll talk more about low voltage. And probably if you've been looking at this EKG for five, 10 seconds or so, you're probably also noticing what we refer to as electrical alternance. The QRS complex is getting bigger than smaller, bigger and smaller. Overall complexes are relatively small, but they're changing size. Now that that we refer to as electrical alternance, the QRS complex is changed in size. There's other types of alternance that you can get also. Sometimes you can get what's called total, uh, it's not a California term, but total uh, electrical alternance, not totally alternance, but total alternance where the QRS goes up and then the QRS goes down and then the QRS goes up and the QRS goes down. That is referred to as total uh, electrical alternance. You may also get P waves that are following in the direction of, of the QRS complex as well. Uh, and you can even get T waves that are alternating in direction. And uh, there is different names. Sometimes people refer to that finding as total electrical alternance. But anyway, the, the key point here is that when you've got the QRS complexes, especially, that are changing direction on a beat-to-beat -beat basis or changing size on a beat-to-beat -beat basis, uh, in at least one of the leads, oftentimes you'll see it in a couple of other leads, uh, and in this particular EKG, you can kind of see it um, in a few leads more prominently than others. That is relatively specific for large pericardial effusions. Not necessarily tamponade. Tamponade means that there's also physiologic problems like hypotension or right heart collapse. But when you see this alternance, it is highly specific, though not pathognomonic, but highly specific for a large pericardial effusion. And especially in a patient with the history of cancer who's presenting with shortness of breath and orthopnea, well, you've pretty much got your diagnosis right there. So I just want to talk briefly about pericardial effusions. We talked about this before. Actually, in November 2011, if you scroll all the way back on the website, that www.ekg.umem.org, scroll all the way back to November 2011, there's a 16-minute video that talks all about pericardial effusions. And I'm just briefly going to recap that. You recall the classic triad, and I oftentimes joke it's kind of a joke, not totally a joke though, but the term classic in medicine means it's not always there. Classic means it shows up on the boards, but not always in real life. Uh, classic to me also generally means 15%. 
um, in medicine. And this triad, uh, although it is classic, it is not uh, present in the majority of cases, maybe not as low as 15%, but more likely um, the electrical alternance, you'll only see it in about 30% of cases. And the full triad, you probably get in about uh, maybe 15 to 20% of cases. So don't rely on electrical alternance. But again, on the board exam, electrical alternance, low voltage, tachycardia, that's your classic triad. But I do want to remind everybody that in real life, alternance is not always there. It's only present in about 30% of cases. And the full triad in real life is only present probably in about 20% of cases. Uh, what about low voltage? Let's talk briefly about low voltage. How do you define low voltage? Sometimes people just look at an EKG and get this gestalt of low voltage, but it does have a more specific definition. This is the definition that I learned from Dr. Edward Chung, who is an EKG guru at Jefferson Hospital in Philadelphia. It's a simple uh, definition. It is fairly sensitive. You might read some others, but this is the simple one that I remember. What you do is you take the QRS complex amplitudes in leads 1, 2, and 3, add them up. If it adds up to less than 15 millimeters, call it low voltage. So if we go back to this 12 lead EKG, the QRS complex amplitude here is about, I don't know, four millimeters, and that's about four millimeters, and that's about four millimeters. One plus two plus three equals less than 15. That means it's low voltage. The other way of defining low voltage is take the QRS complex amplitudes in V1, V2, and V3, and if they add up to less than 30, then that is defined as low voltage also. We'll go back to the 12 lead once again. So the QRS complex amplitude, even if we take the bigger one here, that's about eight or nine millimeters, and then that's about 12 millimeters, so up to 20, and then maybe take that one and, you know, V1 plus V2 plus V3 is um, is less than 30 millimeters, and so that is low voltage also, okay? So, and remember that the word or is here. So somebody can meet low voltage based on that or on that. This particular case meets low voltage based on both of these criteria. You'll read some other definitions that are a little bit more specific, but this is the definition that I like. And if somebody meets this criteria, then I call it low voltage. And I start thinking about a handful of things in the differential for low voltage. Here's my differential for low QRS voltage. And I split this into two categories. You can have low voltage if the heart is weak. I think of the heart as a battery having low power. If that battery or heart has low power, you're gonna have low voltage. What kind of things give you low power? Well, severe hypothyroidism or myxedema can give you low voltage. End stage cardiomyopathies, not early, but end stage cardiomyopathies can give you low voltage. And then infiltrative diseases like sarcoid and amyloid, uh, those can also uh, produce low voltage because they make the battery weak. And then the other thing is that if you have conduction blockage, then that, <clears throat> that's going to also produce low voltage. You think about the heart producing this, um, this current, and then, you know, here's the person's body. Well, here's the person's body. I'm having some trouble. Here we go. Here's a person's body, and there's the, the EKG leads out there. Um, and this current has to travel a certain distance to make it out there to be picked up by the leads. If there is something blocking that current, for example, let's say there's a pericardial effusion, there's a lot of fluid, you're gonna get a decrease in conduction of that power out to the leads. Um, let's say that you've got a pleural effusion, there's fluid in the lungs, and that's blocking the current, that's gonna produce low voltage. Let's say that there's a lot of fat, the person's obese. Obesity will produce low voltage. And also let's say the person's got a barrel chest from COPD uh, and this is all air. Well, that's gonna produce low voltage as well. So that's my differential for low voltage. When you see low voltage, think about a weak battery and think about something blocking the current from the heart out to those leads. <clears throat> all right, so simple take home points. First of all, don't rely on alternance. It's always in the textbooks, it's always on the boards, but in real life, again, alternance is present in less than 30%, what's probably more reliable and what you're gonna see more often, a combination of low voltage plus tachycardia. 
Whenever you see low voltage plus tachycardia, forget the alternates. Low voltage plus tachycardia, get your ultrasound and rule out pericardial effusion, especially if that low voltage is new. If you get an old EKG and they didn't have low voltage before, but now they do, you've got to worry that the patient has a pericardial effusion. That's a deadly disease that you can't afford to miss. All right. So again, here and here's a nice example uh, of a patient with low voltage. Add those up. It's less than 15. Add those up. It's less than 30. All right. Low voltage plus tachycardia. This person had prostate cancer with uh, pericardial effusion because of a metastasis to the pericardium, and the patient was bleeding into the pericardium, and we nearly misdiagnosed this patient's having a PE. Right. Uh, prostate cancer plus shortness of breath. You think that's a PE, but think about pericardial effusion. We got a 12 lead EKG, saw tachycardia and low voltage. And so rather than thinking PE, because of this EKG, we got the ultrasound, we saw a big pericardial effusion, we made the proper diagnosis. Notice there is no alternans on this 12 lead EKG, just tachycardia plus low voltage. So simple take home point tachycardia plus low voltage equals pericardial effusion until proven otherwise just get your ultrasound and take a look and uh, back to the case that monica sent again thanks so much for sending a great case to talk about the patient ended up having a drain of a large pericardial effusion and hopefully is doing well now um, again thanks to the folks at parkland for sending these ekgs and i uh, hope that case is helpful remember if a person's got a history of cancer and they have shortness of breath, don't just think about PE. Think about pericardial effusions also. Look for that low voltage in tachycardia. And if you see it, get the ultrasound. I hope that was helpful, and I will talk to you next week. Bye for now.